Welcome everyone to the MMA Vivid section with me, Zane Simon, and my co-host, Connor Rebish. We are here with a cold opening this time, I guess. I don't know. I, I didn't have anything planned. and um, <laughs> But we're here to talk about UFC 222, uh, Cyborg versus Konitskaya, and a pay-per-view card that, like, I'm actually, I'm anticipating this just because I like watching the top two fights and everybody involved. I like watching Cyborg and I like watching Frankie Edgar and I like watching Brian Ortega. Mm -hmm. And that is, you know, that's enough to get me invested. And then otherwise this card's kind of a weird combination of like a whole bunch of fights I'm kind of interested in. And I have like some notable parts and people, but I don't know that I've, ever watched less tape getting prepared for a show because so much of it is just looking at it and being like, Oh no, I, yeah. Okay. Okay. I get it. No, this is the, the dynamics of this fight are incredibly simple and will play all out along incredibly simple lines. And there's yeah. not really any reason to get deeply invested in trying to figure out the, the pieces. Mm -hmm. Which isn't to say that they're all easily predictable matchups. It's no. just that, like, the it's kind of on the surface clear what they will probably look like. Yeah, I mean, it, out outcomes are never easy to predict, but a lot of fight prediction is getting like two or three plot lines that you can see being likely, and then picking the right one. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I, yeah, that, that's really all it is. So. So we better come in. We we better we better come in with like a serious batting average on this one, Zane. We we better get eighty percent of these fights correct. Oh, we've talked about how how yeah. transparent the matchups are. Yeah, I know. Well, it, it'll it'll probably just be totally fucked, and it'll be like that. Oh, what was it? There was a card a couple weeks ago, or like a couple months ago, rather. I can't remember which one now, but it was like okay, this all looks pretty interesting, like pretty down to numbers. And then it was just all of these fighters winning in ways that were completely against their type or losing because they didn't do any of the things that they normally do. Mm. And it was just like, fuck, I, what, what am I supposed to do with this? How, how am I supposed <laughs> to use any of this information? <laughs> it was whichever one had that... Uh, Oh, Barella versus um, Holly Holm Light fight on it. Oh, Barella versus uh, Kat, uh, not Catlin, Caitlin Chikagian. Yeah, Chikagian Barella. Whichever had that, that whole card was just like, I'm not really sure why any of these people won or what they were trying to do. So, Jacare Brunson too, our favorite. Oh yeah, Jacare. It was the Jacare Brunson two card. Yeah. All right. <laughs> After that edifying trip into momentous MMA history. Anyway, let's jump into the bottom of this card and our first fight up a light heavyweight bout Jordan Johnson versus Adam Milstead. Kind of weird that Milstead's dropping the light heavyweight here. Um, yeah, I mean, he's, he's not a heavyweight he's, though at like 225, 230, 235 pounds. So he was a switch. A small heavyweight. It's probably honestly like most times the ideal size for a heavyweight, as we've yeah, discovered. I, I like, don't know that this will work out for him, but yeah, I I'm why he's I, trying it. Yeah, I'm not sure why that like that Curtis Blades that Curtis Blades fight taught him the lesson that you need to drop weight rather than you need to improve your wrestling. Yeah, well, uh, I mean, I don't even know that it's necessarily that he needed to improve his wrestling since it was just sort of him getting picked up and thrown around the cage by Curtis Blades. It's more of like a you need to not fight Curtis Blades. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that too. But but the it's it is a little strange to me that the lesson he took away from that was, you know, you need to drop uh, down to 205 because at heavyweight like, I think he he had the makings of a pretty good heavyweight fighter. He's Yeah, and you know, not many people at that division have the physicality of Curtis Blades. Right, yeah. And and Milstead did have good physicality at heavyweight. He he was pretty fast and 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 relatively agile for his size. Um, the benefits of being a smaller heavyweight, and seemed to have good power. And uh, I remember being really impressed with his stamina in previous matchups as well. That he could throw a lot of heat and mm -hmm. recover relatively quickly. Uh, he would definitely get tired. He is a heavyweight, yeah. but he would recover without needing nearly as much time as a lot of other heavyweights do. Yeah. Um. 
I have no idea how he will look at 205. I really don't. If the weight cut will affect him, how he's recovered from that knee injury, which seemed to be a pretty grisly one. Yeah. Um, more grisly than it had to be, probably, because he kept fighting after getting it initially torn. And um, I think I'm just going to favor Jordan Johnson based on momentum. Like, I, I think I'm going to favor Jordan Johnson to uh, to box Milstead up a little bit. I think Johnson might be able to out-wrestle Milstead if he wants to. Uh, but I mean, it could also just be a fucking war because Milstead is Milstead is down to throw combinations and he will counter and respond in kind. So it could, if Milstead looks like he did at heavyweight, it could easily be a very close fight. Yeah. I mean, there's always a bit like, I'm always concerned about wrestlers going up against guys bigger than them. Mm. Always just because there's, Wrestling really, there's a reason wrestlers cut so much weight. It's a lot easier to take people down and control them when you're the bigger guy. So that that would be my one concern here, honestly. But otherwise, you're talking about a really consistent D1 All-American, highly technical wrestler against a dude who, as you said, maybe took the lesson, not the lesson away from his his last loss that he needed to improve his wrestling. Mm-hmm. Um. Milstead style is really just to square up and throw hands and squaring up puts him in prime position to be taken down. So um, the only problem with for Johnson really is that he doesn't have a great connection and fluidity between his boxing and his wrestling. So he is a very willing boxer and will load up and look to throw his right hand and step into the pocket with it. But he doesn't really have the step into a takedown motion. So he kind of ends up having to walk through fire to get in on somebody's hips and chain together his takedowns, which could be a problem against a huge dude who could, you know, maybe stuff something and throw a bunch of strikes. But I still got to take the much better wrestler over the guy who is dropping, who's maybe making an ill advised weight cut. Also, the fact that you've frozen up on me made it a little weird because you were just staring into space for like five minutes and I was, there we go, Handy's back. A cat unplugged my ethernet, that's what happened. <laughs> Hello. So, all right, I'm picking Johnson, mostly just good wrestler against bad wrestler. Seems like an easy dynamic, but we'll yep. see if Johnson's boxing disconnect makes that any more difficult. Yeah, I think that's a good point. Odds on the fight. Johnson is a sizable favorite, opening at minus 275, adjusting up and down to minus 253, and then sliding slowly out to minus 312. And uh, Milstead opened at plus 195, adjusted up and down to plus 187 or so, jumped up to about plus 224, and has slowly risen to plus 246. Pretty wide odds for Johnson, who uh, has looked like his wrestling looks good and technical, but he he also ate a lot of shots from Marcel Fortuna and has taken everybody to decision as his competition has stepped up. So yeah, and Fortuna being like a one shot at a time kind of fighter, hitting him that easily doesn't necessarily bode well against Milstead, who loves to throw combos. So. Yeah, so I, I think that that's. I get why it's wide, but I think it's a little overly wide. Agreed. Um, that brings us to a bantamweight fight: Brian Caraway, Cody Stamen, and part of me really wants to pick Stamen here. I like his, you know, we we saw in the Duke and Wa fight that he has an effective, creative kicking game. Working with uh, Crookshank seems like kind of the guy who is a better athlete than Crookshank and so then can actually do more with Crookshank's style and make it a little more effective by being a bit more of a fire plug. Yeah, maybe that build kind of helps. He's just this yeah. like, squat little brick so house. He's got that. He can be a busy striker in flurries when he decides to, but he's otherwise off. He also often just kind of sits back and lets the fight happen and kind of watches gets himself hit a bit doing that tends to uh 
be very, very inconsistent about defense. He either kind of tends to tighten up high or just not defend and look to strike. Um, if, I mean, th- the whole thing here really is that this is the big test of Stamen's wrestling at an elite level. Mm-hmm. Because he's probably the better striker than Caraway. But Caraway is a consistent pressure fighter. Mm -hmm. Has become one over time. Somebody who will just kind of walk you down, pick his punches, look for the same few things, and use that to get in on takedowns. After which he's a very technical, technical wrestler who changes his approaches, changes his angles, goes from single to double, turns the corner, hits a sweep and it hits a trip will do whatever it takes. And then as an expert at taking the back and keeping it and holding positions, I just don't feel like I know enough about how Stamen performs in that situation to pick him over Caraway here, because I think his, especially his willingness to get backed up and to either be high guard or just kind of open defensively will let, and his, Throwing a ton of kicks too will let Caraway get in on takedowns. And I've seen Stamen scramble up and get back up to his feet against worse wrestlers. But if you're going to give Brian Caraway a lot of takedown opportunities, that seems like a great way to let Brian Caraway win a fight. So, yeah, yeah. Um, you know, I, I think. Obviously, there's a lot more depth to Caraway's um, wrestling than there than there is Stamens, at least as far as we've seen. It seems yeah. like there is, um, but I, I do like I do think Stamen has some ability to kind of deny the pressure fight that allows Caraway to get to that wrestling phase. Uh, that yeah. was one of the most impressive aspects of the fight against Dukenwa was that mm-hmm. he forced Dukenwa to back up uh, during the second yeah. half of that fight. He really got him to respect his hands and had him second guessing. And he became the pressure fighter and he looked quite comfortable even when he wasn't pressure fighting, but he also, he looked equally as comfortable coming forward. Yeah. Um, he looked very, it was a very measured competent performance. And that's the kind of thing that gives me the feeling that he, he might be able to show up and just fight a smart fight against Caraway and, and kind of, nip the wrestling in the bud as it were and and deny him the chance to 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 back him up and 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 get into those messy scrambles so i think i'm gonna go with stamen for that reason um and i'm also i don't know this this might sound a little weird but how how's brian caraway doing after misha tate left him and immediately got pregnant uh (laughs) I mean, I think she left him long enough ago that he may have beat <laughs> Aljamain Sterling. Did he? Okay. He if that's the case, I don't know. I mean, I would, I would be heartbroken. I don't, I don't know how Brian Caraway is handling it. So I don't know. I, I, yeah. I... <laughs> that might, that's a weird thing to bring up, but there, it there, is. There is a, I have more of the feeling that he'd be the kind of dude to like have a secret shrine going and be sure that she's coming <laughs> back to him someday, than to be like, if only he devastated. wins this fight. Yeah, if only he wins this fight, she'll come back. Yeah, right. Even although obviously that's not the case because she, she went with Johnny Nunez, who is a worse fighter than Brian Caraway. Yeah, it, it's <laughs> certainly not fighter quality that no. has, has driven her from his arms and into the arms of another. But Brian doesn't realize that. So he is sacrificing to the shrine, killing a little pigeon he found in the alley next to his apartment <laughs> before the shrine. And then he comes to this fight and wins because he has something to fight for. Yeah. So maybe you're right. I mean, th- this is to me, this is very much a Cody Stamen show up fight where mm-hmm. I, I can see how he can win. You're right. Like I can see how he could, especially with his striking variety, if he can keep care away from getting to, if he can keep his kicks in a way, unpredictable enough that Caraway doesn't use them to get takedowns Mm -hmm. and he can use that to pressure and to put Caraway on his back Mm -hmm. foot and to stop takedowns then he is a much busier more diverse striker than Brian Caraway yeah and and I see uh, uh, to to use a little MMA math I do see some stylistic parallels between Stamen and like a Takeo Mizugaki Mm. Who I remember giving Caraway a pretty tough competitive fight just because he wasn't easy 
to to grab a hold of, and he was an acceptably good busy boxer. So yeah, the other thing though with Stamen is I don't know if he's actually not easy to to grab a hold of, or we've just been learning with Duke and Wa that the physicality doesn't match his will, and his wrestling is suffering because he was used to having a physical edge that he no longer had mm-hmm. at this level. Yeah, although we did we did point out, I'm just remembering on on heavy hands that um, Stamen's reactive takedowns could be very helpful for yeah. stymieing some of that pressure, as long as he doesn't then think I'm going to stare under the ground and 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 give Caraway three minutes in which to maybe sweep or reverse me. So yeah, I, I think prolonged wrestling with Caraway would be yeah. a, a way to lose. But he is a good offensive wrestler. So no, he is. Yeah. Uh, odds on this, he's actually favored over Caraway. Which I guess um, I, 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 I feel like that's mostly just because nobody likes Brian Caraway. Oh, for sure. <laughs> yeah. So how many people have lost money on Brian Caraway because they just hopefully bet against him? Yeah. <laughs> Caraway opened at minus one twenty, or Stamen opened at minus one twenty rather, dropped to minus one fifty seven, and has stayed pretty stable right there. He's at minus one sixty one at the moment. Caraway opened at minus one twenty as well, so they opened dead even. Jumped up to plus 123 and is currently at plus 134. All right. That brings us to a welterweight bout, Mike Pyle versus Zach Otto. Uh, you should really buzz through this, please. Yeah. Um, I don't know. I don't, I don't think this is actually like a walkaway win for Zach Otto because Zach Otto is not a puncher. You know, like <laughs> that's the that's the thing that's been troubling Mike Pyle, and otherwise Mike Pyle still has some skills, right? He's we've seen in we we didn't get a chance to see anything in the Alex Garcia fight really, but uh, like when he fought Sean Spencer in 2016, you know, like he's still scrappy as long as you don't put him away. He's still very cantankerous on the ground. He's I don't know I don't I don't see this as like an easy win for Otto because. Otto doesn't really seem to know how to put his foot on the gas. Uh, doesn't yeah, really that, know how. That to... I think is the biggest, th- bigger thing than Otto not being a great puncher. It's that he doesn't know how to to continue punching people. Like I, I right. think part part of the reason that he was able to put Kunimoto, Marias, and Berkman into such slow, ugly fights beyond the the reasoning that Kunimoto and Berkman are very prone to slow, ugly fights. Is it singularly? I think he actually hits pretty hard. Mm. It's just that he doesn't follow it up in any meaningful way. Mm. And well, I'm gonna keep it spicy and disagree. I don't. I, I haven't seen anything that suggests to me that he has a lot of power. Um, but maybe I've just missed the details that you've missed. But if that is correct, and if and 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 and, and again, even if he does, the fact that he does not really push the pace. The fact that he doesn't really string his shots together, um, the fact that he seems totally willing to just let three minutes of fight time slip by without anything really happening, yeah, and sort of still seems to expect that like hitting a nicely timed takedown at some point is going to be the deciding factor that it wins in the round. I don't know. That doesn't sound like an approach that'll work against Mike Pyle. So I think they have Mike Pyle. Yeah, I think they've given Mike Pyle a relative softball after handing him to two vicious punchers oh, you make in his this, last this, two fights. This is going to be so fucking that much more fucking depressing when he just gets blasted in like three I'm minutes by Zach Otto <laughs> and we're all just like, oh god. Oh, if he gets knocked out by Zach, I mean, he's already said this is, this is his retirement fight, uh, but if he gets knocked out by Zach Otto, like, that will underscore that decision to step away from the sport. But still, I don't think Otto's uh, going to knock him out like other people do, and I think if you can't knock him out, like Sean Spencer can knock people out. Yeah, Sean Spencer is the the prototype of a light-fisted volume puncher who didn't have the power or athleticism to make that work in that division. Yeah, but he's got like as many knockouts as Zach Otto. <laughs> That's my point. I know, I, I'm people. saying, but like Zach Otto is much more of, I, I see him as much more of a low-volume low Josh Emmett where like Emmett clearly has power but has almost no knockouts in his whole career because it used to be that he was just way too readable as a power puncher. He would just throw the same few strikes over and over and everybody saw them coming. Zach Otto sort of like, yeah, he hits hard enough to not get in a lot of brawls except Li Jinglong who will just 
scrap with anybody and doesn't care how hard you hit him. Mm -hmm. But he uh, and so he's always in these slow paced, ugly fights because people get hit a couple times like, oh, I'll stay outside on this guy. And which if that if that if that is correct, then he probably will knock Mike Pyle out because Mike Pyle doesn't agree to slow the pace down just because you hit him. Yeah. A couple of other things with Mike Pyle in this fight. Uh, going back his last couple fights with Garcia and Mina, he was landing like five to eight strikes around in those two fights and taking big risks when he actually tried to throw those strikes. And he got hurt pretty much every single time immediately mm -hmm. in the fight when he got hit. Going back to the Spencer fight as well, he almost Spencer got hurt him in that fight. Yeah, um, I think Mike Pyle's getting knocked out and around, and it doesn't really matter who he's fighting. He's fair 42, enough, too, and he looks it. Yeah, <laughs> he does. Fair enough. <laughs> I'm just not super impressed with Zach Otto. No, I'm not either. Which is going to make it all the sadder. <laughs> yes, that's. I a mean, good it's point. it's the Josh Berkman fallacy where people are like, "Oh, Drew Dober's not that good." <laughs> he just, yeah, he's still going to go out and fuck Josh Berkman's shit up. Yeah, but Dober's a very different fighter from Zach Otto. I know, um, but who did Berkman fight last time? Uh, Alex Morono, who we also yeah. expected to run after him at least. It's yeah. at least we expect these guys to bring the fight to the aging dinosaur. <laughs> But Otto just coasted to an ugly win over Berkman, which I can also see. I can see Pyle. Right, but that's a perfect parallel, right? Like, Berkman gets lit up and starched by everyone he fights, but Zach Otto took him to a split decision. I know. But Berkman wants to be on his back foot. Pyle doesn't. True. Although now that now that Berkman doesn't want to be on his back foot anymore, we've seen exactly what's been happening to him. So Yeah. Yeah. All right. Um, depression aside... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Mike Pyle opened it my, plus 175 has risen sharply ever since is it plus 234 at the moment place your bets people auto minus 245 has dropped consistently to minus 294 Zach Otto at minus 294 that is just depressing <laughs> yeah uh, all right that brings us to a middleweight bout CB Dalloway Hector Lombard and um, this is the one of two complete coin flip fights on this card. Actually, one mm -hmm. of a few complete coin flip fights on this card. And I'm going to do what I, the stupid thing I've been doing for a while now. And it almost pays off, but still hasn't. I'm going to fucking pick Hector Lombard. <laughs> Rock and roll, baby. Because it almost paid off against uh, Anthony Smith. He mm -hmm. almost knocked Smith out early in that fight. It almost, I think I may have picked him against Johnny Hendricks. And it almost, like, that was a close back and forth fight. Mm -hmm. The thing is with Hector Lombard still. Him against Henderson. He almost got it done there. <laughs> he keeps he coming very close. Against Henderson, picked him against Henderson. And against fucking Neil Magny. Every single time he almost gets it done. Yeah. Which could easily be what happens here. I, I'm not picking Hector Lombard because I'm like, oh no, Hector's going to win. The thing is, is that C.B. Dalloway is in a position where if you watch any of his recent fights, he literally gets hurt every time he gets hit. Mm -hmm. Like even his win over Ed Herman, you watch the first round of that fight and it's C.B. Dalloway getting hurt like three times before ending up on top of Ed Herman. And, you know, Nate Marquardt, too, is just, like, them staring at each other and then Nate Marquardt eventually deciding to leap in with a punch and knocking Dalloway out. He is really only at his mo really only comfortable when he's physically tying up with people in the clinch, in takedowns, things like that, where Hector Lombard is still really strong and hard to take down and hard to control. And Lombard is, he's much, much, much more fragile than he's ever been, but it's still a volume fragility. It's still Anthony Smith needing three rounds to, to find the shot that puts him away. And Dan Henderson needing two rounds and a full flurry of weirdness to put him away. And Neil Magny needing 
basically that was just an exhaustion TKO. And then Johnny Hendricks, he, they just traded shots for three rounds. Mm -hmm. So if I'm looking at CB Dalloway getting wobbled by everything that hits him, and his best run, run be or his best chance being to out wrestle Hector Lombard. Guess I just have to pick Lombard again, and I hate this. I I I this is it, this is a stupid fight to have to predict. Yeah, it absolutely is, especially because like there's so many other factors going on. Like Dalloway, yep. now has like a a lifelong injury because of his elevator yep. crash. Um, he like got his compacted spine and that caused him to lose mass. And so now he's back at middleweight, uh, even though he was he really wanting to go to light. Have, I have, yeah, everything sucks here. Um, I think I agree. Like, uh, I just think that the, the deciding factor in the Ed Herman fight was clearly that Herman is not a great wrestler and was too slow as Ed yeah. Herman always has been to stop a shot like CB Dalloway's. And um, that has never been Lombard's problem. Lombard is incredibly difficult to take down, even more difficult to hold down. Uh, he's, you know, he's almost as fragile as CB Dalloway. More? I don't know. Like, uh, Lombard's been getting knocked out more than Dalloway, but it has also been, like, the thing is, is the result of his knockouts has often been that he, as we said, can't put away the guy in front of him, where it's like... Yeah. Sometimes he goes after them and then and then gets put away as he as he starts to slow down. Dalloway doesn't typically if somebody lands a really big clean power shot, I don't necessarily see him surviving the Lond Lombard onslaught. Yeah, uh, that's that's really what it is for me to come back. So basically, just Lombard gets there first. Yep. Yeah, I agree. Don't like it, but I agree. Yep. Odds on the fight. Hector Lombard is the slight favorite. Uh, minus 120 up and down. Uh, or adjusted up and down. Ended up at about minus 158 and has slowly climbed up since then to minus 142. Dalloway, the underdog, mine, opened at minus 120, jumped up and down to plus 129 and is slowly sliding back down to plus 116. I'm fine with these odds being close to even. For oh, yeah. two dudes who seem to fight okay until they get hit and then get knocked out. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I think they should absolutely be dead even odds. That brings us to a Bantamweight fight. John Dodson, Pedro Munoz. This looks familiar, Zane. Have we talked about this matchup before? Yeah, we have. Uh, well, if you want to hear the analysis of this matchup, go and check out our episode <laughs> before UFC whatever. Uh, I, I'm going to say the same thing I said last time because nothing has changed. Um, I think that Munoz, with his kicking game and his pressure, could potentially give Dodson problems. But I think Dodson's speed, his lateral movement, and his, uh, his own uh, good, effective kicking game and sharp counterpunching is going to be the difference. I think Munoz just doesn't know how to... Um, change his style or he's not willing to change his style when somebody touches him up and he's just not he's a, a very very hittable fighter no matter what he's doing in the cage and uh, Dodson just doesn't really seem to have other than the, the kicks maybe to cut off that lateral movement I don't see Dodson having any clearing weaknesses that Munoz can take advantage of just by trying to walk him down and force a fight on him we saw how well Dodson handled that when it was John Lineker doing it and many people thought he won so I think Pedro Munoz is not going to have as much success as Lineker. Cause yeah, and he still had a lot of success with uh, even with Marlon Marais doing it, you mm -hmm. know? And somebody yeah. who's got a ton of power and danger in any one moment that Munoz just doesn't have. He yeah. doesn't Lineker. have the power to, if he catches you off guard, really put you away. And if If Munoz were to really, really push his wrestling advantage, I think that would be the way to win this fight. Um, Munoz is a pretty big bantamweight. I think that's why the first fight was called off because mm -hmm. he was yep. too big. And uh, if that were the case, then I could see this going a little bit the way Alex Perez versus Eric Shelton went last weekend, where you have yeah. this really quick, smaller guy who just can't physically hang with the bigger wrestler. So that is an option, but I don't think Munoz is quick enough to track Dodson down that consistently. No, and Dodson has infinitely more experience than yeah. Shelton in figuring out exactly how to get away from that kind of pressure and fight yes. it past it and work around 
somebody who is trying to chase him down with just one thing. He's yes. very adept at escaping pressure. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I mean, there's not a lot else to go into it. Dodson, he's got his left hand that he likes to spam over and over again, and that predictability could be a problem, except that Munhoz is predictably... Predict. Yeah, he's predictably there to be hit with yeah. whatever you're throwing. So well, sometimes he does this. Yeah, sometimes he. he yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I do love defense, so I've studied Munoz's methods a lot. Yeah. No. I mean, he. You know, put your hands up. If you're doing that, if you're not dropping <laughs> your hands, then you're basically in a def prime defensive position. I like to imagine that Pedro is utterly shocked every single time he gets hit with his hands up. He's like, "What?" <laughs> like, like the other guy put in a cheat code. How did that happen? What's going on here? <laughs> yeah. Oh, Lord. Maybe it's one of those things where, like, you know, his gloves are, like, enchanted with one of those, like, every time you hit me, it hurts you kind of thing. <laughs> he has a vampirism. Yeah, he has a vampirism. Charm on his gloves. Yeah. <laughs> you just see a glow of red light coming out of John Dodson's body and into, like, the center of Pedro Munoz. Dodson's getting slower and weaker. He doesn't know what's happening. I, lo I love that. <laughs> You know, I love crossing dorky fantasy shit over into the world of combat sports. Yeah. Otherwise, it's, you know, like I said, I think the dynamics, we talked about this at the front, but I think a lot of the dynamics of these fights are pretty simple dynamics to examine. If things go differently, which they might, it'll be because somebody radically stepped away from their game in the past. Yeah. Uh, odds on that fight. Dodson is the favorite, opened at minus 111 and adjusted down up and down to minus 138, slowly trending down to minus 165. Munhos uh, opened at plus 260, adjusted down to plus 159, and is currently at plus 152. What, what like dumb odds maker opened Munoz at those odds? They all, they No reason he should be that big of an underdog. Yeah, well, I don't know. I mean, I kind of also feel like this is also getting, like, Dodson, this this is getting close because it's Dodson being second, or, like, people have had time to second guess this fight and, like, seeing it again, and so it's like... Sure. So maybe, maybe yeah, maybe he shouldn't have, be open, oh, shouldn't have opened at plus 260, but him being at, like, plus 130 and Dodson being at, like, minus 170, I feel like it could be a little further than that. Hmm. It feels okay to me, like in the 180-ish range. Munoz is a, is a different kind of fighter than Lineker. He's a vicious kicker, and he does have a, a really quality wrestling game, yeah. underrated wrestling. So he has some options for a big bantamweight that somebody like John Lineker, former flyweight, doesn't. So I don't know. I'm okay with it being somewhat close. Yeah, the biggest question to me, honestly, is if Dodson tries to wrestle him. Mm -hmm. I don't think yeah. he will, but... It would be very risky if he did. I wouldn't do it. Yeah. Uh, that brings us to a lightweight bout. Benil Dariush versus Alex Hernandez. And, uh, yeah, so this is kind of a weird... I I don't mind this fight so much, watching tape on Alex Hernandez. I still think he's going to lose. What little footage there is out there of him, I like. Oh, yeah. Because it's, it's kind of like watching tape on him. Like, he kind of fight like Benil Dariush. Mm -hmm. But right-handed. Like Which, he, I would love to see two uh, opposite stance Benil Darius is fighting. <laughs> yeah, like he loves to pressure and, you know, come in behind hard combinations favoring his backhand and throwing hard body kicks to go with it. Mm -hmm. And he then uses that more often than Darius to transition to takedowns and power takedowns. Darius has really kind of tended to be a let's keep this boxing and standing as, as long as possible fighter these days. Um, except for that terrible Chiesa fight where he just, man, the hell. <laughs> Maybe that's why he's been keeping it standing. He's a little shook because he, he went up against the RNC King. Yeah. And then Hernandez does well to, you know, get the back. He's got a good squeeze. He's good at asserting, uh, you know, he, he, there's only brief highlights out there. I've seen of him. Most of his fights are not online at all. Yeah. Although but, I will, 
it, talking about his squeeze, like that did stand out in that submission over yeah. whoever, his RFA 47 fight, I think it was. Yeah. And um, the guy peeled off the hand on the choke, and Hernandez kept the pressure on by just gripping his shoulder. Yeah. And he barely got the hands reattached before the guy tapped. Like the squeeze was on the whole time, even when yeah. the choke was being stripped. Yeah. Like he seems really good at keeping his pressure arm tight and then reasserting it with every chance he gets. So it's not like, you know, he's just trying to pull his own arm across. It's that the squeeze is coming from the arm across the neck. Fingers are creeping and it's got that constrictor kind of, it's just every time you give him a little space, he he eats it up and it gets tighter. So I I really like the look of him and his fighting style. I like what I see out of him. It's just hard to imagine him being ready to fight Benil Dariush. You know, Darius has problems. He tends to kind of, you know, we saw in his uh, fight against Evan Dunham where he poured it on early and couldn't get the finish, and then he tends to slow down a little. And this is, I mean, this happened to him in that Edson Barboza fight as well. Not that he poured it on early, but he's just not a very, he's not an elite athlete. He's a good athlete, but he's not an elite athlete, and he tends to fight with a high pressure style that emphasizes a lot of power and it drains him a little, it slows him down just a touch. Yeah. So certainly if Hernandez is a better athlete and could keep the fight going and doesn't just get lit up and put away early, then this could get messy late. There's a chance. Um, But I got to pick Darius to control the pace control the pressure a lot of this will probably come down to controlling pressure because what we've seen from brief highlights of hernandez it's really hard to know how he's going to do if he's put on his back foot like all we've seen of him is success running forward into people yeah and if he has to fight in his back foot if he has to be defensive if he has to watch for strikes coming in i really i don't know what to expect at all so or it also could be the case that Darius is just the best boxer he's ever faced. Because yeah. remember when Darius faced a pressure fighter in Michael Johnson, he did really well to keep his yep. jab on him. I know people were upset that that win went to Darius, but it was very close throughout because Darius yeah. has a good jab and good footwork. And like the, really, D- Darius is – sorry, I'll let you finish here. I mean, you, you were picking Darius, right? Well, yeah, I was just going to say, I, I thought Dar- I was fine with Darius winning that fight. I thought it was close, and I thought yeah. that he hit Johnson a lot harder in a lot of the rounds. Mm-hmm. But, uh, yeah, either I way, like- I just, I'm, I'm picking Darius uh, mostly off the experience and the as- assumption that if it's going to be two guys who want to pressure going forward to win, Darius is, much, is going to be better at establishing that pressure. And I've seen Darius have to be defensive, and he's a reasonably functional defensive fighter when he has to move backwards. He's good at st- finding a safe range. Yeah. Yeah, he's he's got reasonably good footwork. And, I mean, really, Benil Darius is, to me, a, a strong example of how important athleticism can be because mm-hmm. he really, by all accounts, is a very intelligent uh, and really, really dedicated fighter in the gym he works extremely yeah. hard he's always there he's sort of like a second coach to some people because he really understands how the game works and wants to get better and he wants to fight like an rda and he just can't he just yeah. can't keep that kind of rda pace he can't put on that kind of rda power to the same degree that an actual Rafael dos Anjos does um but this fight is also going to be a a treatise on the value of experience uh Darius just um, it's, it's certainly possible that Hernandez does have some options in his back pocket, but we have never seen them. Um, and Dariush, we have seen them from him, and he probably has a better idea of how to force his fight on an opponent who just wants to do the same thing to him, but in a less sophisticated way. So I like Dariush by experience. <laughs> Dariush yeah. by decision sounds about right. Um. Darius is a sizable favorite open at minus 350, has slowly slid out to minus 378. Hernandez opening at plus 250 and slowly moving up to plus 296. It's reasonable reasonable for me. Yeah. Uh, Takes us to a woman's strawweight bout. Ashley Yoder, Mackenzie Dern. 
Um, would you consider this one of the other coin flips? I don't know if it's quite a coin flip. I mean, I, I don't think it's a coin flip, really. It's just one of those fights where I watched about a minute of footage on each person. <laughs> and I was like, okay, yeah, now I know exactly how this fight's going to go. And I'm pretty sure I know who's going to win and why, but it's yeah. you know, anybody this inexperienced, it, it, there's always going to be a major coin flip factor. Yeah, because I, I mean, I do feel like Ashley Yoder can beat Mackenzie Dern. Oh, she's um, a much more technical fighter everywhere except grappling. Yeah, exactly. Uh, she's 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 just a sharper fighter. Like her her game just she's not really more experienced in terms of number of fights, but it's clear that she has spent more time working on her game than Mackenzie Dern. Um, yep. But the, the problem is that I've never seen Ashley Yoder execute the way I think she would need to to consistently beat Mackenzie Dern. It's not that she doesn't have the skills to do it, but uh, she's she's never put them all together in that perfect of a way to to make it work. Yeah. And so I just think that uh, Dern is going to keep the pressure on her, which seems to be something that she's uh, she wants to do. She's, she has like that inexperienced fighter kind of pressure where she just doesn't have the patience to sit around and wait. She just wants to take the fight to you. And against somebody like Yoder, I think that'll work because Yoder has always been super willing to accept the fight wherever it goes. Most of her wins come by submission. And the moment she agrees to tangle with Dern on the ground, I think the fight is going to start to slip away from her. Dern is a really phenomenal submission grappler. Um, she, she's essentially like the, 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 best, the best submission uh, artist after Ronda Rousey, I think, to, to be picked up in MMA, in women's MMA. So... Um, I just think Yoder is, even if she starts off strong and, and tries to move around and use her, her kicks and her long punches to stick Dern, um, I think she'll have some success with that. But the moment she agrees to grapple, it becomes Dern's fight to lose, I think. Yeah. Dern is, uh, to date, I, I don't think she's actually tough. Uh, and I don't think she's, and I don't mean like tough, like menta mentally. I think mentally she's pretty tough. I don't think she's actually physically durable. Mm. Or tough um but to date she thinks she is she hasn't found that out yet yeah she hasn't found that out yet and so that means that she's just very confident in her ability to just walk forward and pressure and throw power and be the toughest person in the cage just say i know i'm tougher than you i'll bite down and we'll i'll throw and i'll stay after you and Yoder doesn't have power, really, at all, and is very willing to just to be on her back foot. And when she does pressure, every now and then, it's always pressure to clinch up and hit takedowns. Yeah. Like, anytime she moves forward to throw a strike, anytime she's not moving backward and throwing a kick or throwing a long jab out there, Anytime she's stepping forward, it's with the intention that I will throw one strike or two strikes and I will clinch and I will get the t I will work to take this person down. It's never like, oh, I'm going to throw a strike and then I'm going to plant and like keep exchanging and work in the pocket and, you know, see if I can make something happen on the feet. It's just, okay, it's time to push and get a takedown now. And it's impossible to see somebody who's going to be getting walked down and only going to be moving forward to try and get takedowns beat Dern that way. Like, that just, if she's not going to hit Dern hard enough to knock her out, and she might, it could happen. Dern, like I said, she's, I don't think she's actually physically that tough. And she's awkward as hell standing up. So mm -hmm. there's plenty of opportunities to hit her. But, but definitely getting better too. Like yeah. she, her striking looked at least she seemed to have more confidence in it and, and had some basic idea of how to put strikes together. She is against, against Kalina Medeiros. She's terribly awkward with her movement in a way that makes me think yeah. that she may never actually be able to strike functionally. Yeah, she has a little bit of like a Dan Henderson sort of <laughs> shuffling a, a look to her, and she doesn't have Dan Henderson's excuse of being nine hundred years old. Yeah, or having the kind of immense earth wrecking power that means that all if it, all, that if only all you do is shuffle and throw a right hand, everybody actually has to be really worried about that. 
She's How got great this, would it like, be? Her hips move really weird. And like Ronda Rousey? Yeah, like Ronda Rousey. Where, like the hips are like she knows they're supposed to move, but it's not entirely connected to what she's actually doing. Yeah. And when you see her throw kicks, it's like, I need to take two steps and then I'm going to pick my leg up and then I'm going to turn my whole body over and that will rotate the leg into the person and then we'll come <laughs> back down. Like, there's a yeah. disconnect there that has me. But it's probably too soon because, again, her first fight was in 2016. I know. Um, I there, think she, she's definitely improved. There's room to improve, lots of it. But there's an awkwardness that I wonder if that will ever go away. Like we see out of some grapplers and wrestlers where it's just like, you know, like, like Phil Davis, even as he's become like a better striker over the years, he still looks super janky, yeah. you know? There's just an awkwardness that will never leave Phil Davis standing up. Yeah. Um, and Dern has the misfortune of being uh, uh, being able to fight at 115 pounds because <laughs> honestly, like honestly, she might want to move up to 125. She missed yeah. weight a couple times. 125 would probably be a much more forgiving division for a developing fighter. Right now, yeah. yeah. Women's straw weight in the UFC is stacked. So yeah, Yoder is like the soft entry, and then if she gets matched up with somebody like Tatiana Suarez or even Alexandra right. Albu, who. Sure is a mess and could easily get subbed out by Dern, but is also just kind of a physical beast who moves with a lot of natural fluidity. Mm -hmm. And has a much scarier key eye than Holly Holm. <laughs> a much scarier key eye. <laughs> Very true. Anyway, um, yeah, I, I'm picking Dern. Yoder just seems like the physical low end of the division and a style that's made to be beat, but... Yoder is as close to women's bantamweight as women's strawweight gets in the UFC. Yeah. Um, odds on the fight: Yoder is coming in at a huge as a huge underdog, plus three twenty five. Opened at plus three twenty five, dropped to plus two thirty, and has climbed steadily back up to plus three sixteen. Dern opened at minus four seventy five, adjusted up to minus two ninety nine, and has fallen back down to four twelve. Honestly, that's absurd. There's every chance that Yoder front kicks off her back foot or throws a long right hand, just knocks Dern the hell out. Yeah. Um, like, Dern is not that good at all. Yeah, and and we have absolutely no idea about how she actually, you know, yeah, it's there's no reason for Dern to be a massive favorite over almost anyone at this point. No. Fight favors her, but... You know, that that's it. It favors her. Uh, that brings us to Woman's Bantamweight, Kat Zingano, Ketlin Vieira. And I think this is just the right fight for Vieira if they're going to keep pushing her to title contention, honestly. Mm -hmm. Zingano, I, I like her. She seems like a really nice person, but... Uh, it's also kind of become clear over the years that she has good power in her strikes, but she has never developed a fluid idea of how to strike consistently in MMA. Like, seeing how she fought Juliana Pena, mm. and it was just like, you're just going to run at and wrestle this woman? That happened after the fight with Ronda Rousey. Yeah. Anything was going to wake you up and be like, maybe I should fight a little more measured, especially against somebody who really wants nothing more than to grapple me. Nope. Run that Juliana Pena right from the opening bell, just like you did in your last fight. Yep. And she's had this problem in multiple fights where like, it's you know, fights. she will almost, she, what she wants to do is she doesn't want to strike with people. She wants to be on top of people on mm. the ground. And so she runs at people. She looks for head and arm throws. She looks for takedowns if she can, you know, most mostly throws. Honestly, that tends to be the baseline of her takedown game is throwing people, which she's strong enough to do. But, um, and, you know, she can land hard shot, single shots in the clinch or from distance as she's rushing in for those. But even on top of people, her top game is really unstructured it's not built to uh conserve her top game it's not built to stay on top of people and um 
she just kind of ends up she she's very much ends up in the flow of the fight where her athleticism and the fact that she can be crafty and like opportunistic in places has saved her a lot in the past. Mm-hmm. You know, she's put herself, she was losing handily to Misha Tate and then got like one opening and just blasted Tate. Yep. So it's very much a Kat Zingano is very much just goes out and is like, I'm going to get in a fight. And then for better or worse, she fights yeah. like a maniac at all times. And it was like her fight. With, her fight with Pena was like Pena fighting a version of herself that just couldn't grapple as well. Yeah, exactly. They both just d- didn't know how to say no. <laughs> and Ketlin Vieira is not that person. Ketlin Vieira is pretty controlled at all times. You know, she's shown that she knows how to step right into the pocket and stay in the pocket and throw combinations while being in the pocket and without closing her own distance down or pulling herself back. Which, mm-hmm. especially, like, the ability to do that alone is kind of, especially women's bantamweight. It's it, rare in MMA in general that people know how not to smother their strikes. Yeah. Um, at women's bantamweight, it is actually a pretty remarkable <laughs> ability. Yeah, it's pretty shocking. Because even, you know, even fighters like Holly Holm and Valentina Shevchenko and uh, Caitlin Ch- Chukagian they don't necessarily smother their strikes, but they lean out of their strikes constantly. Mm-hmm. They pull their own weight off of their punches and their own distance off of their punches in ways that make them not nearly as effective as they should be. And Vieira is one of the few who just will sit in the pocket and just be like, okay, I'm going to you know, pull back a little and look, come back in with an uppercut or with a hook and with a jab and look to keep my combinations going makes her a really interesting fighter to watch. It means that in prolonged exchanges on the feet, Zingano may hit harder, but Vieira is a lot likely to hit a lot more. Um, and beyond that, v- Vieira is a better lockdown top control player when she gets positions. She's much better at, okay, I have a position, I want to establish it, and I want to work that position to build offense off, off out of it. Zingano is just like, oh, did I see an opening? I better jump on that, and we'll see where that takes me. And so Zingano could catch her out. She's dangerous. She's a good athlete. She's strong. But I got to pick Vieira to win every minute of the fight that she's not, like that Zingano isn't outright winning because of some singular moment. Yeah. If um, if, if Vieira's uh, ground game wasn't as solid as it was, this would be a very different matchup. Yeah, because uh, like one thing you can say about Kat Zingano, she always comes in in phenomenal shape. Yep, and I uh, like e- even if she ends up in some terrible spots early because of her style, she can finish the fight savagely. As you pointed out, she's she's very opportunistic and she's always ready to take yep. advantage of an opportunity. Uh, down to the last second of the bout, she's ready. Yep. Uh, but. Combined with Vieira's grappling ability, having a better, more control-oriented top game, um, something we have, like against Pena, we saw Zingano struggle with. Uh, combined with the fact that she seems to have, she seems really composed. Yeah. Um, one thing I, I I'll always remember, because it was hilarious, but uh, when Sarah McMahon mounted her and then started r- raining down punches. And it was kind of like McMahon ended up looking like Holly Holm, even though she was on top of somebody, because it was like she was <laughs> kept coming up short. But Vieira yeah. knew she it, was it coming up short. It turned out that her arms are short enough that they don't reach to her own waist. So <laughs> leaning back bend, a little from Bend mouth. over, Sarah. Bend over slightly. Uh, but also, like, Vieira was deflecting, keeping her hands inside and her eyes on McMahon and knew that the shots weren't hitting her. So she didn't yep. crumple. She didn't cover up and flinch and close her eyes. She just kind of, like, watched McMahon missing her with 20 consecutive ground and pound strikes and then swept and got out of the position. Yeah. And, like, if you need a – if there's a certain attribute that will help you deal with the kind of maniac style of a Kat Zingano, it's that. Yep. It's being able to have somebody – come running at you five seconds into the fight with a double flying knee and say like, okay, I'm going to try and hit them with a right hand as they do it. I'm going to stand here and try to hit them with a right hand. And uh, yeah, I think Vieira has that. So I I think this could easily go either way uh, because it's, it's always difficult to predict his Ngano fight because like 
I would have always picked Misha Tate over Kat Zingano, but that's one of Zingano's best wins because Tate let her guard down for a second and got splattered from the clinch. So yeah, I mean, uh, she beat Amanda Nunez and Raquel Pennington, and you yeah. know, a lot of these fights were fights where she was losing and then just kept finding opportunities and ways to battle back and then eventually got a finish. Yeah, but typically they're, they're opponents who also make uh, large errors. Amanda Nunez gassed herself badly and then got beaten up. Yeah, Vieta just staying composed and staying ready to respond should hopefully be enough to eke out a decision. I think it'll be yeah. close. I, I won't be surprised if Kat Zingano has a moment in any given round where she almost finishes this fight. But it's just outside of those moments, I expect Ketlin Vieira to be winning the majority of the fight. Yeah. Agreed. Um, odds on that. Vera is the favorite at the moment, opened at minus 174, adjusted up and down to minus 130 or so, and is slid out, slid out to minus 151. Uh, Zingano opening at plus 145, adjusted up and down to minus 102, and then has slowly risen to plus 126, which I'm actually fine with. Zingano... You know, she fights to her own detriment, but she's a dangerous finisher. Oh, yeah. Uh, and that brings us to a heavyweight bout. Stefan Struve, Andre Arlovsky. And, um, yeah, this is you. Well, <laughs> at least this isn't the main event anymore. This, this is the other <laughs> fight where I'm just like, fucking flip a coin. <laughs> yeah. Um. Do you remember what was the fight on a couple of weeks ago that I was like, "Oh, I hate this. It sucks." Uh, was it Tabora Lewis? It was Tabora Lewis. <laughs> that fight totally sucked. I was completely justified, even though it ended in a spectacular knockout. It sucked the whole time up to that. It was just frustrating and like, "Ugh, why is heavyweight like this?" Um, well, this is a matchup of two guys who are almost certainly done uh, as far as like top top line competition goes, but both of whom looked pretty good in their last fight. Yeah. Stefan Struve showed some nice boxing against Alexander Volkov. Uh, he was... He, Stefan Struve is such a bizarre case because we had like the, uh, the fight with Big Nog in 2015, and that was a performance where, oh my god, he's using his reach. He, he's, he's sticking and moving, <laughs> both at the same time. Uh, and that honestly was something he struggled to do throughout his entire career up to that point. And then he kind of lost that ability, it seemed. Um, he lost the confidence to do it. I don't know. But then against Volkov, the guy with his reach, it was back. Yeah. Um, the guy who actually had the reach to trouble him with that style, Struve showed one of his best performances in years and was really competitive, especially in the early going. Um, meanwhile, Andre Arlovsky had a maybe underprepared Junior Albini in front of him, but really fought a perfect fight to beat him and also showed some new wrinkles. Andre Arlovsky, a fighter who has had very one-note boxing throughout his career, was throwing left hooks and more jabs, but mostly left hooks. He yeah. wasn't. This is a fighter who had such a such a gaping hole in his striking game because of the absence of a left hook that one of his great developments was to add in a right back fist after the straight right <laughs> where normally the left hook would go. Um, and he was using it against Albini. Like he, he looked great. I really was yeah, super yeah. impressed with Arlovsky in that fight. Um, but both guys are fragile and both guys are aging. And um, I mean, Struve just aging in fight years, but he still looks like an old fighter. And, um, I don't know how those improvements <laughs> match up against each other. I think I will take God. I Jesus. I don't trust Struve to show up looking like that again. I just don't. If he does, I think he could really knock Arlovsky out yeah. because he ha he has like an insane reach and height advantage, make very difficult for a for a fighter like Arlovsky who's never been a giant heavyweight to even reach his chin. If he just fights to his uh to his potential but i just don't trust him to do it because i have no idea what inspired that in the volkov fight i have no idea why it disappeared after the big nog fight but do you trust yeah. arlovsky to show up with more left hooks i mean yeah phantom skills <laughs> yeah i guess um i don't know why i feel like i trust arlovsky more I, maybe i shouldn't 
But yeah, <laughs> that is at least two performances in a row from Arlovsky where we've seen him come in with an intelligent approach to his opponent. The Tabora fight where he's like, I got to clinch this dude. That was, I think, at least a smart veteran move. And then the Albini fight. So we have two in a row and only one for Struve. The math is obvious. <laughs> I'm going with Andre Arlovsky to uh, outbox and put the pressure on Stefan Struve and, and force him to crumble. But I don't know. I'm I'm picking Struve. Honestly, the biggest thing is that I can really easily see Arlovsky getting caught cold by a clinch knee or a jump knee. Sure, yeah. Because even old Struve has always had that ability. Yeah. He's always been a good clinch fighter and a willing, uh, willing to throw <laughs> flying strikes fighter. Is there any way to be bad in the tie clinch when you are seven and a half feet tall? No. And I think that's just too dangerous, as well as the possibility that Struve might actually, you know, fight outside to his strengths. Because even a good performing Arlovsky in that fight with Albini still dips his head and throws yeah. heavy out like hooks, which could be enough to just catch Struve on the end of one. I mean, I think he might be swaying me though. I because I, I, I saw Struve in that fight and I was like, wow. Yeah. <laughs> this would his, be his so ability to, like if he can even just like find that rear uppercut, which is an ugly, horrible punch to lead with when your head is as far up in the air as his is. But he found it really well with Volkov. If he can find that as Arlovsky's dipping, yeah. or find his his knee his flying knees or his clinch knees. I like him to knock Arlovsky out. Yeah. I mean, this, the uppercut is a fantastic punch for someone with Struve's height. It's just that Struve has never learned to, like, you know, like maybe flash them with something in their face for a second and then fire it when they move. Yeah. Their yeah. Head. He, he throws the rear hand uppercut cold. That's his, per that, that's what I mean. It's he, not he, like you shouldn't throw an uppercut, but it's just like he's up there and then it's just like, oh, let me, you know. Yeah. He does like the Jackson wink, the old school Winkle John thing of just like select a strike out of mid, -air, out of the air and throw it. And maybe they won't see it coming because it's different than the last strike you threw. Yeah. I think you may have sold me though. I think, um, well, I don't even know if you sold me. You just picked Struve, and now I suddenly feel like Arlovsky. God. I mean, part of this, too, is that I think, honestly, too, what I liked about the Struve fight against Volkov and that I, I've seen from him more recently, other than really other than the Arlovsky, or the Overeem knockout, which was just kind of predictably Overeem ragdolling him down and then punching him a bunch. Yeah. Um, is that what really cost Struve against Volkov is that he gassed. Yeah. Like, he, he, he picked a pace to fight that he could not maintain. Mm -hmm. And that could be a problem against Arlovsky, but I don't see it being nearly the same problem. It could be. I mean, Arlovsky is a substantially better athlete than Struve. He, he's yeah. faster. I think he's always been better conditioned. Um. You know, maybe we've underestimated throughout his career just how difficult it is to be as awkwardly huge as Stefan Struve is. Oh, yeah, definitely. Like Travis Brown, we used to talk about like, oh, he's really athletic for a guy his size, but he would always gas like four minutes into a fight because you can't be athletic for your size if you are that size. Yeah, well, um, you certainly can't if you're going to go through the Jackson Wink select a strike and then yeah. move to Edmund Tarverdian to clean that all up. Some parallels here. Yeah, but, but I will say like Struve did... Honestly, like the, the level of range boxing he showed would have worked better against anyone except Volkov because Volkov has Struve's frame. Yeah. He's the same size. Uh, now, okay, I'm going to stick with Arlovsky because I want to keep it interesting, and it's, it's, it is a coin flip. Odds on this, Stefan Struve is the favorite, opened at minus 370 somehow. <laughs> Somebody loves giving money away. I don't know what the hell happened there. What, who are these odds makers? Open at minus 370 is now at minus 187. Has been trending continually upward since then. Arlovsky opened at plus 285 and has been falling continually downward is now at plus 156. So they're, they're about right now, but... <laughs> Yeah, now the odds make perfect sense now. I wish I could have gotten Arlovsky at almost plus 300 because that makes no sense. 
All right, that brings us to O'Malley versus Sean O'Malley versus Andre Sukumta in a bantamweight fight, and um, this this is kind of a uh, oh, who this is kind of reminds me of like the Mackenzie Dern Ashley Yoder, but at like a much higher level mm-hmm. thing for me. Where O'Malley is like the guy that people are super excited with, and they've got somebody in front of him who can beat him, but probably doesn't have the style, right? And probably just won't fight the fight to beat Sean O'Malley. Because Sukumta, you know, his his thing is it's really frustrating because he's obviously a very good athlete, <clears throat> very powerful, fast. Be able to be very dynamic, technical, technical, technical. Muay Thai striker has a has a skill set that yep. he knows how to use, but pretty much needs two full rounds to figure out his range and his timing on his strikes. He obviously, you know, he he did better uh, against Luke Sanders, getting the knockout early in the second round, but that was also just kind of. Sanders' relentless... Pr- and that could happen here. Like It, it could be the same thing, where, uh, like O'Malley, Sanders' relentless pressure style just led him onto Sukumta's strikes often enough to get the knockout. And O'Malley's willingness to just spam endless combinations could lead him to get countered hard and knocked out, because Sukumta does have that power and that ability. But... Sukumta is not a highly comfortable counterfighter. Really, by the once he gets going and once he gets his range and his timing down, he's much more of a pressure combination striker moving forward. Mm. He, you know, a lot of his like almost all of his early waiting and countering and things like that is all just really a comfort thing. It seems like, and. If he's going to give O'Malley two rounds to just kind of figure out what he wants to throw and to be creative, I feel like that's a bit much bigger problem for Sukumta than it is for O'Malley. Yeah, that that's a good point about um, Sukumta's preferences because I would peg him as a counterfighter because that is how all of his fights look. Yeah. Uh, but maybe like... He has like a Muay Thai pace where he just like has to give some time away and doesn't really want to counter. It's just like how he stops people from picking up the pace too much Mm -hmm. and then wants to come forward. Because if you look at some of his earlier fights, there's a lot more like walk people down, put combination body shots on them and that kind of thing. But we haven't seen that much in the UFC because he he seems stuck in counter punching mode for at least two rounds. Yeah. I mean, what you can see is, is like, you know, even early on, it's got like, you know, he's had some, obviously he's had some be- better wins, but it's like second round submission, second round doctor stoppage, second round TKO, decision, couple of early wins, and then like a second round submission, second round no- knockout, second, fifth round flying knee, second round knockout. It's always, I'm going to hang back, I'm going to let the fight come, I'm going to like try and figure out what's going on, and then pressure. Then I start to like, find my you know like you don't throw a counter flying knee he's obviously doing that as a pressure fighter like that kind of striking is coming off of i think him. it was a counter flying knee was it the cody norby <laughs> one i think he threw a left hook and uh and jumped as he was throwing the shot maybe but, was but it? it wasn't it wasn't an off the back foot counter flying no, knee. it was it, a it, we're both trading an open space counter yeah yeah Anyway, the point being, he's he wants to come forward in the end. And I think that because of that, I mean, like, it makes him... Otherwise, he would be a much more opportunistic counterfighter. And he's not. He's much more just like, we'll just let... I'll just let a lot of things go, and I'll, let, I'll lose and pick off the occasional shot sometimes. But it's not like I'm just sitting and waiting to pull the trigger on this counter. And I, because of that, I, I can't trust him to find that moment to knock O'Malley out, which O'Malley may be there to be knocked out. But um, yeah. O'Malley's, most of his problem is not really bad defense so much as it is 
uh, that he fights at such a high pace he's going to be hit a lot. Mm -hmm. And then he fights at such a high pace that he tires himself out. And then he has no defensive fundamentals once he's tired. (laughs) Yeah, because the defense is really like built into the pot shotting offense. It's really like the angles that come after the strikes are the defense. Yeah. Uh, and without the strikes, the defense isn't there as much. Um, yeah, yeah, I, you know, I still like, from what I've seen from Sukumtot, I think he, whether he wants to or not, he does get stuck counter punching. Yeah, and and that's you know whether or not it's his preference, it's still a problem against O'Malley. Um, that that I think is gonna, it's gonna be the stylistic uh, aspect, the however you want to phrase it, that prevents Sukumtot from working his way into this fight because O'Malley, the one thing that really stands about a. a stands out about O'Malley's game is how he plays with rhythm and tempo, how he, I mean, a lot of pot shots, but very, very difficult to predict when they're coming and where they're going because he does a good job of mixing up his targets and changing his timing. And he does some other tricky things like um, he'll leave his fist in your face after he hits you as he angles off. Um, I always call that like sticky punching, but he'll, (laughs) he'll just kind of stick you with a shot. And then as he's moving, He does not withdraw the hand right away. He wants to keep your eyes covered as he takes his angle. He's tricky when he's got his strikes flowing, and it makes it really hard for somebody like Sukumtot, who tends to try to just unload like two or three shot combination counters in the first couple rounds to actually pick up on the opportunities to counter. Um, When is it a feint? When is the strike actually coming? From which hand? Which direction is he going after the strike? And that's that difficulty is compounded by the fact that Sukumtot also is uh, sort of in contrast to O'Malley. He's sort of one note with his own rhythm. Uh, he throws his shots and it's like yeah, one, two, three, everything's fully loaded up. I think he kind of gasses himself a little bit too. That That's the other thing is that for a guy who needs to kind of wait till late in the fight to get right. his offense clicking, the reason he's lost two of his fights is, you know, especially like the Albert Morales fight, but the Perez one too, is that by the time his offense is ready to click, he's too tired to fight. Yeah. At by the, the time he's, the he's he got wants. his, by the time he's read his opponent and found where he thinks his openings are, he, because he throws everything with power. He's kind of like a, like a Jose Aldo type where yeah. everything is just like a full powered shot. And, and there are limitations to that style. And O'Malley is, if we're, Making parallels, O'Malley is much more the new breed Max Holloway type yeah. of striker. So, yeah, I like O'Malley to win. Sukum Todd could absolutely catch him because O'Malley is um, he is very used to just having his way with his opponents and can be caught by surprise. Well, he, when you throw as much value volume out as he does, there's just no way to be a capable right. defensive fighter. Sure. Like, Especially not young. Like he's got, he's good at moving his head out of the way. He's good at rolling with shots. Yeah, we're seeing more of these fighters like um, that come in with actual preset defensive yeah. moves. Uh, yeah. Like uh, uh, Brandon Davis is yep. another example of somebody who is a an aggressive striker. But it's like, oh, he moves his head after he hits people. Yep. Something we've not seen in MMA for so long. O'Malley does have that at least, but yeah. it is still. Uh, also, like Venata's defense was when he first debuted, it's still a little rote where it's like, I hit the two strikes, now I roll this way. And if somebody is just, if somebody's capable of picking up on his patterns, then he can be surprised. Yeah. And they're just going to work in enough of a pace that they're yeah. always going to be hit sometimes. For sure. Know? Yeah. Like every time we've seen, you know, people like Cody Garbrandt and even Conor McGregor and all that, people are always like, oh, their defense is so bad. It's like, it's do you realize how 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 much of a pace these people are putting out when they and like how much pressure they're putting out on their opponents when they're they're doing this you it's not it's not a zero sum thing where you can be this amazingly tight defensive fighter and throw a hundred strikes around why isn't why is justin gaethje so much easier to hit than edson barboza why do you think (laughs) because he's fights the way he fights yeah yeah all right. Um, odds on this fight. O'Malley op- is a slight underdog, in fact. I'm surprised. Surprises me, too. Opened at minus 248, so opened as a big favorite. Jumped way up immediately to m- plus 118, and it's stayed pretty flat there, now plus 115. 
And Sukumta opened at plus 192, adjusted straight down to minus 162, and is currently at minus 140. I'm yeah. a little surprised that a dude who lost on to like somebody like Albert Morales is a favorite here. I mean, yeah, like that, that Sanders win definitely counts for something, but it, the, it counts for a lot. But but he, but he lost some not necessarily impressive splits to Morales and Alejandro Perez. Yeah. Even if, you know, I thought he won the Perez fight, he still, like, kind of gave it away. Yeah. There's going to be a point right in the second round of this fight, I get the feeling, where Sukumta is going to have a big opportunity to put it away. And if he doesn't, he'll likely be too gassed to win it. And uh, that'll be it. Like, that'll be the swing. Yeah. That would be my bet. Uh, Next up, co-main event. Frankie Edgar, Brian Ortega. And uh, yeah, this, this is you. This is, this is a fight. Uh, I, I desperately wish this was five rounds. I, yeah. In this case, like it's not like last weekend where honestly I think Andraj Torres should have been the main event and was a good enough fight that yeah. like, that, was a, that was a fun contest. It should have been the five-round main event. Uh, in this case, I get it because Cyborg is actually a draw. Unlike Jeremy Stevens and Josh Emmett, people know who Cyborg is and seems to, she seems to be like the best the UFC has that isn't Conor McGregor is like a 300,000 pay per view selling fighter. And Cyborg seems to be at that level. Um, people care about her. Yeah. She's, there's, there's novelty at least. So I get it. Uh, I still really wish this had, I had five rounds to see how this one plays out because uh, both Frankie Edgar and Brian Ortega tend to get better as the fight goes on. They both mm-hmm. have that tendency where Frankie can be caught really easily early. uh, And he also, you know, like when he's not warmed up, he tends to be easier to hurt as well. He actually takes shots better later in the fight. And uh, likewise, Brian Ortega just becomes more and more offensively potent as the fight goes on. Uh, And we have two just like absurdly different fighters here. A really, really co- a strong contrast in styles with Frankie Edgar as this tiny wrestle boxer with a crushing top game versus the gigantic, lanky Brian Ortega um, with bizarre scrambling submission game, opportunistic submission game. And I think thing is, is like Brian Ortega has been aspects of his game have been getting better quietly, even if we haven't been noticing, like his boxing is definitely coming along. Yeah. Um, it, it doesn't, it doesn't all flow as a game. The, the pieces it, aren't, it looks so much better than it did in his clay Guida fight. His, his Cub yeah. Swanson fight and his Moicano fights looked so much better than that Guida fight. Yeah. And even in the Guida fight, he had his moments where it was yeah. like, okay, he knows what he's doing with that. I can tell he's worked on that, and but he doesn't know like when to throw it or how to set it up, or he's not comfortably cycling through all the things he's learned. He kind of runs out of ideas yeah. for, for stretches of time. He looks like an inexperienced striker, uh, but you look at what he was doing in the Cubs-Swanson fight, and there were some things to like. Yeah, He was walking into Cubs' jabs and left, left hooks, and as he was coming forward, not really making Cub respect his reach, um, he was giving Cub Swanson what you shouldn't give Cub Swanson, which is an opportunity to just mix up his targets with weird pot shots. But he also, like, defensively wasn't terrible. He, he, was, he was catching right hands on his shoulder. He was blocking combinations. And then in moments when he seemed like, he just kind of seemed to decide, okay, now I'm going to start throwing punches. Uh, they looked pretty good. Yeah. And, and they have for a while. There's always been these little flashes. Uh, but I don't. He, he seems like somebody who has got a bunch of really good technical advice that they are very, very slowly parsing yeah. into a complete style. Like he's not learned the fundamentals of like you are going to learn basic one hundred and one striking Henry Hoof style, and we're going to be like, okay, jab cross. You're going to do that for like four fights now. It's much more like okay, we've got somebody who's teaching you like a tricky defensive comprehensive style, and it's all really hard to do. And you're just going to have to like constantly trial by fire it until you, it all yeah. clicks. Yeah, it's been a weird kind of development because Ortega, with certain aspects of his skill set, has been an elite, at an elite level this yeah. whole time. So he's been able to get by with really like shaky 
boxing where the, clearly the technical advice is there that things have been drilled. There are moves, but they're not all in place yet, yeah. uh, but it doesn't matter. Like he's still winning fights and, and um, that does speak to where he's particularly dangerous for Frankie Edgar, because obviously uh, one of Edgar's big advantages over most opponents is his wrestling and his top game. And depending on how he approaches the wrestling, he could be in some serious, serious danger, especially uh, I think that the, the serious danger zone is the Ortega front headlock. Um, when Frankie, if Frankie attacks a uh, head outside single or a double, a uh, reactive double, and that's how he tries to get this to the ground, Ortega is just terrifying with that, with the guillotine, with the Dars, with the Bravo, the whole front headlock series is dynamite for him. And um, I'm not as worried about Ortega off his back against Frankie Edgar. I'm not as worried about Frankie getting caught in a triangle. I think Ortega will certainly surprise Frankie with a few things, but like uh, we, we were asking this on heavy hands this week, who has actually even come close to submitting Frankie Edgar? And somebody pointed out Ben Henderson got him in a guillotine. That was fairly close that he fought out of, by the way, that's Ben Henderson's move. That yeah. is his submission and, or, and Edgar escaped it. And uh, Yair Rodriguez went for a desperation knee bar and got his ass whooped for it. So and that's all I can think of. Like Frankie Edgar's jujitsu is criminally underrated. Uh, and people actually speak of it highly, but it's still underrated because it is really, really strong. So well, because he's not a competitive jujitsu player. Like he's a black belt, but you don't hear like Frankie Edgar right. running through, you know, we need to see Frankie Edgar metamorphs. Like we need to see I would love to. Know, yeah, I would love to. Uh but he didn't he didn't come in as a jujitsu guy, but he's no. a Hicardo Almeida black belt. Yeah. And, you know, like we have seen him thrash good grapplers on the ground more and more at featherweight. And as his career has gone on, yeah. Frankie has kind of winnowed down his his really hectic style. And it's something that's very efficient and straightforward yeah. where there's there's less extraneous footwork. There is um, a, and, and there is a lot more focus on control on having that sort of, as you say, a lockdown top game where. You do not want to be stuck in half guard with Frankie Edgar on top of you. He is brutal from that position. So I have faith that Frankie Edgar can approach this fight intelligently enough to avoid the danger zones in Brian Ortega's style. Uh, I really think this comes down to strategizing around what Brian Ortega typically does. And while that still gives Ortega a lot of opportunities to surprise Frankie. And especially if Ortega suddenly turns a corner with his striking, the massive reach advantage cannot be overlooked because I think Ortega is more, he offers more of a threat than Yair Rodriguez, for example, uh, if you were to approach him as a, well, if he ever starts striking well, I can just take him down type of fighter because he, he wants that in a certain sense. More than Rodriguez was, he does not care if you try to take him down. He's very, very comfortable off of his back and hitting submissions as you shoot your shot. Uh, but I think Frankie Edgar can manage the style matchup intelligently as he has so many other times. And even if he has a little trouble early, do what Frankie Edgar does and, and work his way into the fight. See, how does he react to this shot? Okay, that's how I set him up for this. Now that that's working, that's how I set him back up for the first shot or something else. Edgar's a great flow chart kind of fighter, and uh, that makes it really difficult for an inexperienced up-and-comer like Ortega to beat him. So I'm going with Frankie. Yeah, it's hard because I, I really want to pick Ortega here a lot, mostly because I've never, I, I you know, if you look at Frankie's recent performances, there's pretty much no fight where he isn't willing to take somebody down. Mm -hmm. Like, that's just an ingrained part of Frankie Edgar's game. Doesn't matter who he's fighting, he's going to chain takedowns into his boxing. It will always happen. And, oh, except against Chad Mendez, because he wiped the floor with them in a yeah. hilarious fashion. Hilarious. Don't be so cruel to my boy Chad Mendez. I still like Chad. I don't care about the cream. I know. <laughs> but uh Edgar is he is really smart. And there's a there's a couple there's a couple things that kind of both trouble me and push me towards Ortega here, which is honestly that he doesn't actually get taken down until he is ready to be taken down. Mm. Like, you look at his Clay Guida fight, which is a great example. Like, somebody, a, a very good wrestler. Somebody we know is a good chain wrestler who can put shots together, 
can take people down, has taken down pretty much everybody he's ever faced, with rare exceptions. Clay Guida didn't land any takedowns in that fight, and he tried a bunch of them. Every time he would get close, Ortega's arms would start to go around his neck, and Guida just basically had to let go and drop out of a shot. So Ortega really only tends to let himself get taken down when he thinks he can already get a submission, like when he's got the locked. submission already on the way. Yeah, yeah. But, I mean, Frankie Edgar's a different dude, you know? Like, he he's is Frank a different... Edgar. <laughs> yeah, he's much more of a... Uh, you know, he's got much more of a flowchart style than Clay Guida. Clay Guida is always the dude who just goes for the single, the one one or two takedowns that Clay Guida does, and he keeps going for them and stays on them and works on them until you break. Yeah. Edgar is, you know, we've seen in a bunch of fights beautifully the guy who you watch him and he's like, you're like he'll go for a takedown. You're like, he didn't, wow, well, he didn't get that. It, he didn't look like he even tried for it very hard. And he'll go for another one. And you're like, oh, that. Didn't is Edgar like not gonna wrestle this fight? He doesn't really look like he's working hard on it, and he'll set people up with like three or four weak takedown attempts just to see what their default defense defaults to, and then he'll find the avenue around it, and then suddenly he's just taking taking them down left and right and outworking them. Yeah, he treats takedowns the way that like uh, Tarek Safadine treats low kicks. Mm -hmm. He's gonna probe and test. He's like, are they gonna check? How are they going to react? Oh, they're not. Now I'm going to show them what a real attack looks like. Yeah. Um, and he will and consistently push for takedowns that you've already shown him you know how to defend, too, because you're defending in a way that opens you up for something else that he wants. It is interesting, though, that he didn't really have success doing that against Jeremy Stevens. He got him down five times on, like, 14 attempts, and each one of them was pretty much just Stevens hit the mat, popped right back up. Yeah, I think Stevens wrestling has actually improved pretty dramatically though in recent yeah. years. He he's not not he hasn't faced a ton of people like that, but even like nobody's really been able to take him down at featherweight. But that's kind of where we are with Ortega too. Like nobody's sure. really taken Ortega down and just or at least they haven't for a while now. And so there's a serious chance to hear that Frankie Edgar's insistence on making wrestling, keeping wrestling a part of his arsenal is going to eventually set him into that one submission that he just can't defend, mm -hmm. you know? Uh, until he does, though, he's going to have a huge advantage over Ortega striking. Ortega has improved a lot, his fluidity striking, his jab. His ability, his willingness to counter, all of these things have improved a lot. But he tends to also, as you say, just pick a time where he's like, okay, I'm punching now. And he'll just walk in and throw like five punches with like his feet planted and no real plan around it. It's just like, okay, I'm going to throw a bunch of shots now. And on defense, he can counter, but just as likely he'll just sit and watch a punch come in and try to see what's going on and get hit. Um, Edgar should have the ability to kick him apart and with low kicks and to find boxing combinations inside to slip counters and to stay on that kind of fight. It's just all a question of how much does Ortega land in the meantime? Does he find a way to stun Frankie a little? Um, Frank, you know, it's not like Frankie can't be hurt. A little and if he gets hurt does he try to wrestle um because being hurt and then trying to wrestle is like the brian ortega game plan to a t yep so i really want to pick ortega but it is much easier to see edgar finding the ways to solve ortega's style yeah. than it is to just bet on well ortega is just going to keep finding those miracle third round submissions that he always does yeah, and there and to be honest, there is very likely some of like the Yoel Romero brilliance to Ortega that we have yeah. yet to kind of find the key to explain. Where it's mm -hmm. like, oh, there's something more systematic going on here than we realized. Um, I'm I am willing to, yeah. When that realization comes, I'm going to accept it because with Yoel Romero, like to me, it's very clear now that yeah, you can look at him setting these things up and eyeing his openings, and he knows what he's doing. Um, and I think Ortega might be the same, but 
you know, like. But we like, know that Edgar is doing that. Like exactly. We, we can see exactly how Edgar is doing that. Yeah, exactly. And I mean, I, if, yeah, if this is a fight where if Ortega catches Edgar out with the submission, like, I think that deserves, like, it that deserves to be recognized as the amazing feat it is, even as good as Ortega's submission game obviously is. Yeah, Frankie Edgar's never been submitted. Yeah. It deserves to be a thing that you're like, oh my God, I can't believe he did it. I can't believe he did it again. You know? Yeah. I mean, on the surface, this is a matchup between a guy who has never been finished and one who has only won by finish in the UFC, which that alone is really compelling. So, yep. I'm, I'm down, man. I'm, I'm super hyped for this one. Again, I wish it was five rounds. Yep. I do too. Um, Edgar is the slight favorite, opened at minus 155, dropped down to minus 196, and has it jumped, or has slowly, slowly, slowly trended up to minus 179. I shouldn't say slight, but reasonable favorite. And uh, Ortega opened at plus 115, adjusted up to plus 164, and is slowly drifted down to plus 148. So I'm pretty happy with that. Ortega is dangerous enough and has never lost that. I don't think he should be a massive underdog to Frankie Edgar, even if most of the things we've only seen ever seen Frankie Edgar win or, t- or lose are title fights. Yeah. And even though we have a lot more faith in Frankie Edgar, there are certain aspects of Ortega's game that seem like direct counters to the kind of stuff Edgar likes to do. So, yeah. So we'll, we will see. It'll be an interesting thing when Edgar goes for that first knee tap, you know? Yes. Yeah. Although the first knee tap will probably be a throwaway. So it we'll will. <laughs> It'll probably be nothing. He'll just use it and push it or take it back and then drop back away. But there, there is no fighter whom I've come around on more than Frankie Edgar. Cause I used to just hate watching his fights and I have so much appreciation for what he does now. Like, uh, anyway, I hope to see a lot of Frankie Edgar stuff in this fight, but if I see Ortega stuff, I will still be excited and happy. <laughs> that brings us to Chris Cyborg, Yana Konitskaya. And, uh, the book is the same watching tape for any Chris Cyborg fight. Yeah. It's do they move their head offline when they wa- step in uh, to throw strikes? How do they react when a right hand is coming at them? <laughs> Those are like literally the only two fucking things you have to watch when you're watching tape on a Chris Cyborg opponent. Whether it's Holly Holm or Tanya Evinger or. Who the fuck ever else? Basically, are they there to be countered every time, or are they not? Yeah. And Yana Konitskaya definitely is. Mm. Like, her range striking game, she can snap off some decent kicks, and she's got a couple long punches she throws well. But she doesn't put any weight on anything, because most of what she wants to do, it's a bit like Ashley Yoder, where... Off her back foot, she's got some long strikes she can throw. But if she's going to be going forward, she is dedicated to a straight line forward approach to get to the clinch. And she's not a bad clinch fighter, but she's not a cyborg clinch fighter. Like Lena Lena Landsberg, everybody's like, oh my God, the elbow queen. What if she gets cyborg in the clinch? What's she going to do? Get fucked up. You know <laughs> You know, these are not hard questions to ask. And that's really it. Like, there's not a lot else you need. Yeah, that's that's about it. That's why I just, even though I totally understand it, and it will bring more eyeballs in probably than Frankie Edgar would. Yeah, Frankie Edgar can't break 150,000, so. Yeah, so I, I understand it, but it's still a little disappointing that this is the main event after a scintillating matchup between Edgar and Ortega in the Yeah, corner. but I'm always I'm always there to watch Cyborg. Oh, sure. I, yeah. I yeah, I like Cyborg's fights. It's just not a ton of drama. It, just doesn't, need, it of. doesn't need to be five rounds. That's <laughs> it does. just book a two round main event. Yeah. yeah um I mean yeah, you picking Cyborg, I'm picking Cyborg too, obviously. Kunitskaya has really all we have to talk about here is mostly Kunitskaya because people I think have a good idea of how Cyborg fights. Um, we although, know, we'll throw this out there really quick in case you don't. Not a brawler, yeah. not a aggressive push forward, throw everything all the time fighter, no. a pressure counter fighter who moves forward, 
looks for you to throw, forces you to the fence, waits for you to throw, and then throws heat coming back. Yeah. A very patient, technical, calculated fighter. Yep. And and Kunitskaya, if you saw Cyborg's last fight, Kunitskaya um, bears some considerable resemblance to Holly Holm and what she likes to do, but with the notable differences that, A, she's not a southpaw. I think that threw Cyborg off a bit. It made it so that her jab was not a big part of her routine, yeah. whereas you saw her previous fight against Tanya Evinger, she jabbed the hell out of her. Um, Cyborg has a very powerful, effective jab. Um, so I think that's going to be more present in this fight than it was against Holm. Kunitskaya is also more potent than Holm coming forward. Um, she she actually like she's got a really good teep. I like her teep a lot. She people will kick simultaneously with her, and she'll lift the knee nice and high, sneak the teep in over their kick, and really dig it into the midsection. She's got a good jab as well. Uh, so like coming forward, bridging the gap, she's more effective than Holm, but she does not have Holly Holm's counter punching skill. Um, she's not as effective throwing the strikes, timing them as well as Holly Holm does off of her back foot. And that was what allowed Holm to kind of trouble Cyborg throughout their fight, even in small ways. Without that, I think it's just going to be like the success Cyborg had against Holm, but more pronounced. Also, it's worth noting, I don't know if Kunitskaya is as tough as Holly Holm, but I doubt she is. Yeah, I seriously um, doubt it. Holly Holm, Holm is ridiculously pain. tough. Yeah, insanely tough, both physically and mentally. Very difficult to shake and in virtually impossible to actually knock out. So, uh, yeah, there was a moment I rewatched a bit of Cyborg Holm. And there was a moment in round one where Holm stepped in with like another rote combo. Cyborg cracked her, and you could see Holm's like head whip around. And her eyes were like open for a second and just kind of like, and then she just goes right back to fighting like that. That would have knocked out just about everybody. Most else. other fighters. Yeah. I, yeah. Couldn't Sky has been saying that she doesn't think Cyborg's a real power puncher. I hope she's not basing that estimation off of her last fight because there are very few women as tough as Holly Holm. Um, even if you've seen Holly Holm's one horrible loss in boxing when she was beaten to pieces by Anna Sophia Mathis, she, I mean, she refused to go down. It had to go on way, way, way too long before yeah. that fight was finally stopped. And they had no choice to stop it because Holly Holm had withstood so much punishment. So, If anything, the only reason Cyborg has, her fights have been going longer lately is just because she's become a more patient, less yeah. brawling, more willing to just pressure and counter, pressure and counter, open up opportunities and exploit them rather than just coming out and wrecking shop on people. Yeah, I wouldn't I wouldn't base the premise that Cyborg is not a power puncher off of fights with Holly Holm and Tanya Evinger. I'll just say that. <laughs> Two incredibly durable women. So I think it's going to be Cyborg by a relatively early KO, second or third round. Cyborg is the favorite, opened at uh, minus 1,000, is currently at minus 1,650. Kunitskaya is opened at plus 600, is currently at plus 926. I got no problem with that. Uh, we've lost Connor briefly. Oh, no, you, we haven't. I'm here. Did I look frozen for a second? You did. Sorry. <laughs> what were the odds? I was distracted. Okay. Uh, <laughs> currently minus 1,600 for Cyborg <laughs> and plus yeah, 925 for Kunitskaya. Yeah. I mean, there's no reason for odds to ever be that long, but why the hell wouldn't they be for this? Yeah. Thing? It's fine. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Well, on that note, you can find me on Twitter at these anytime. You can find Connor on Twitter at Boxing Bush. You can find both of us over at BloodyElbow.com. Give us a like. That's a thumbs up thing down there. And subscribe to our YouTube channel, MMANation.com, D-O-T-C-O-M. That's where you get all the latest Bloody Elbow shows, videos, news, analysis, all that stuff we do week in, week out. We will be back not next week, but the week after with UFC Fight Night, Verdum versus Volkov in London, England. Headlined by Fabricio Verdum versus Alexander Volkov, Cohen, Jimmy Manwood, Jan Blakovic. Not a good card, but on Fight Pass, so that makes it a, automatically a good card. Yep. Uh, we will have all our normal stuff, vivisection, care, don't care, if I did it, uh, heavy hands, all that stuff we do week in, week out for that. And next week, we will be back with the MMA Depressed Us because it's not UFC Fight Week. So Woo! everyone stay tuned for that. Thanks, and we'll see you next time.